I definitely read the book because I read the book at school and I can't honestly remember when I saw the Bolting Brothers movie for the first time. Um, but once I'd got involved in adapting the book um, for a, con a contemporary uh, version of the film, um, or at least updated, uh, I went back to the to the Bolting Brothers movie and watched it several times. So um, over the last couple of years, in the early days of developing the script, I kind of got to know it quite well. It has a lot of strengths as a film, um, and it's sort of difficult to know where to begin. Um, the, 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 mo the thing it is most known for is Attenborough's performance. Um, what's interesting to me about that is that although Attenborough had been in the play, there was an original play version of, of Brighton Rock adapted from the book before the Bolting Brothers movie was made. Um, Green loathed the play. He, he loathed the production so much he wanted his name taken off it. So um, it was a brave decision on the part of the Boltings to go to war with Green, effectively, uh, who was attached to write the screenplay by that time, um, insisting on casting Attenborough. And their argument was, we're going to cast Attenborough not because he was in the play, but because uh, he had been enormously successful and done a brilliant performance in In Which We Serve. And the Bolting brothers felt that Green was wrong about Attenborough, that although he had boyish good looks, th that he would have the range and the subtlety and the depth to carry Pinky off. Um, and obviously they were right. It's the performance that Attenborough is probably best known for. It's the performance that really put him on the map. And I think what's interesting about it is the fidgety, nervous energy, the, 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 the sense of cunning and manipulation, the, 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 the way that when you watch Attenborough's performance, you can actually hear the cogs turning and crunching in Pinky's devious mind. And that's a brilliant transposition to film from the novel, where you're actually able to um, read the, the, the literal description of those cogs turning, which of course you can't do in film, it's not splattered with voiceover. So um, it, it, it's a riveting performance. Um, but, but there are lots of other things. Um, there's the fact that the Bolting brothers shot most of the movie in Brighton on location, which was really unusual at that time uh, in the late 40s. Um, and that gave a kind of authenticity, I think, to the film that it wouldn't have had if they'd shot most of it in Welland Studios, which is in fact where they only shot a few interiors. Um, I could go on forever. Um, uh, Harry Waxman's cinematography is exceptional for the time and really turns Brighton into this kind of purgatory that Graham Greene imagined it to be when he started to write the novel. Um, it, it's rightly thought of as, as maybe the greatest British noir of all time. Um, and it was tough to make noir in those days. Um, uh, film stock was slow and you had to uh, crank the lights up high um, and turn the stops on your camera down. And, and, and what they managed on a budget of, I think, £178,000, which was below average for the time, was to produce um, just a remarkable piece of filmmaking. I think it's astonishing how faithful the, f the, the film is to the book. Um, it was censored um, quite heavily by the British censor at the time. He was a man um, uh, who I think was called um, Brooke Wilkinson, um, who um, felt that to be as explicitly Catholic as the screenplay and the film were, um, in the context of telling the story of a vicious murderer would offend Catholics. So actually the original screenplay was far more imbued with Catholicism than the final movie ended up being. Um, but Catholicism is still very much present in the film. Um, and I, I think um, with great effect, you know, some critics at the time, uh, I think the Daily Mirror said that um, it had basically been stripped of, of its Catholicism and Catholicism had simply become an adornment. It, curiously enough, I got exactly the same criticism for, for my adaptation of the book. Uh, but I don't think it's true, and I think Green rightly defended himself at the time actually writing to the Daily Mirror. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, its ability to stay as relentlessly and ruthlessly dark as the book is when it was made in an era where it dictated mostly by American audiences. Movies were, were saccharine and romantic and happy endings. Uh, again, 
chime slightly with the, the context in which um, the contemporary movie has been made uh, was just a, a great um, testimony to the, the, the real teamwork and synthesis between the Bolting brothers and Green. I'm sure the relationship wasn't always an easy one, but um, you know, to, to be able to make a movie where an author as judgmental and intolerant as Green gives you two thumbs up effectively is, um, again, just an extraordinary achievement. If I had to boil that down to one idea, I would say it's the idea of the fallen angel. In other words, a character who is possessed of beauty, of charisma, of magnetism, of charm, um, but a character who is motivated principally by hatred. Um, and that combination of ugliness and attractiveness uh, is to my mind, the, the, the all-time most interesting character template. You, you find it over and over again in movies and over and over again in books. Um, but I love the combination of evil shot through with the possibility of love and redemption. Um, and, I, and we know, because Green said so, that he, he felt that Pinky probably hadn't gone to hell. Um, uh, and uh, that's partly to do with Green's own cosmology, but I think what's interesting about Pinky is that he's not just a mustachio twirling two-dimensional villain. He's um, a, a man, a young man motivated by fear, and I think that makes him a very accessible character, especially in a, in a culture uh, motivated by fear, which ours is now. No. Uh, audiences at the time, certainly if the reviews or anything to go by, felt that Brighton Rock was cheap, nasty, false sensationalism. And if you think about both the novel and the movie, um, it's neither false nor sensational. It's not false because the character of Pinky is an authentic character. Um, he's a character um, uh, shot through with truth. And that character, and indeed other characters around him motivate the plot. So you have that authenticity bleeding into the whole story. In fact, we know because Green has told us that the characters really guided the plot. So in that sense, there's nothing false about the movie, quite apart from the fact they had Carl Ramon, who had carried the switchblade for a famous gangster called Sabini as an advisor on set, uh, and indeed that it was you know, shot on location in Brighton, which was unusual for films at the time. So, so you know, um, we're a sophisticated enough audience now, I think, to appreciate its, its truthfulness. Um, and would we feel that it was sensational nowadays? Certainly in the context of, of movies that are incredibly sensational, um, and there are a lot of them about now. No, I don't think we would. Um, and we especially wouldn't if we are um, aware of the fact that Green's portrait of evil was designed to shock. Um, uh, principally because he wanted you to get a taste of the, the kind of foul-hearted cynicism and, and um, manipulation that, that evil men perpetrate. Uh, it was designed to be shocking. So um, to that extent, um, uh, it, it can't be conceived of as, as sensationalism. There was, there was an important point behind it. Um, and I think modern audiences are and this is why the, the, the re-release is so fantastically timely, um, are more sophisticated and, and less easily offended than they were in those days. Um, you know, uh, uh, if one screened the movie um, in Utah, um, you might get a different response, but I'm speaking of a kind of average metropolitan um, and fairly knowing audience who I think would simply be compelled by the film without experiencing moral indignation. It's impossible to, to objectively answer that question because I'm not Green. Um, I, what I would say is that Green felt that Attenborough did. Um, you know, we know, as I've, as I've mentioned, that he, he initially objected to the casting of Attenborough, that the Bolting brothers, in a sense, overrode Green. Um, and we know that uh, Green um, wrote Attenborough a letter, which Attenborough, um, I think, cherishes to this day, that said, I can't, cannot imagine, I had, misgivings, 
but I cannot imagine the role um, being performed any better. Um, that's as distinct from the Daily Mail or Mirror at the time that said that Pinky's, Attenborough's Pinky was as close to the Pinky in the book as Donald Duck was to Greta Garbo. Um, uh, I think audiences need to judge for themselves, but um, certainly to my mind, if the author was satisfied, then I'm satisfied. <laughs> I don't think um, Andrea Riseborough and Carol, Ma and Carol Marsh are comparable. Um, and that's because it's my understanding that Carol Marsh was a very inexperienced actress. Uh, she was under contract to rank at the time and she was recommended to the Bolting brothers. And when they tested her, she was so diffident as a performer that uh, they had real concerns about whether or not she would be able to deliver the role. But at the same time, the ordinariness that that Carol Marsh was encapsulated was perfect for the role. So the Bolting brothers took a, a really profound and, and smart risk in casting Carol. Um, I didn't have to take a profound and smart risk casting Andrea Riseborough. She's not diffident and she's not inexperienced. Was she able to embody that, the ordinariness that's essential to Rose? Yes, she was. Um, and she did that because Andrea um, has an ability to inhabit a character completely that is very different from being a celebrity or a star actor. Um, uh, Andrea didn't give us a star turn. She simply found elements in Rose that she identified with. When I uh, interviewed Andrea um, first, she talked about the scene where Pinky pinches her hand and Rose says, you can go on doing that if you like that. So the answer is no, Andrea was looking to the character in the book and overlaps between that character and her own experiences of life. Um, would Helen conceivably have thought about Hermione badly um, as she was building the role? No. You know, when I suggested that Helen should have, you know, be a Mae West blonde, and there's some evidence that Green, who was a critic at the time, was, was, had watched a Mae West movie um, round about the time he was writing the novel in 1938 to 9. Um, Helen wanted to be a redhead. I mean, Helen Helen was, again, actually just looking at, at the script and drawing what she felt were the most interesting and compelling elements of that character out for her. We know Green wasn't a huge fan of Hermione Badley in the stage performance and, and indeed not in the film. Um, he described her as, as, as something of a music hall actress posing as a serious actress and felt she stuck out like a sore thumb. I, I disagree. Um, I'm with the Bolting brothers. I think Kamani Badley did a really, um, um, was a perfect piece of casting because Ida herself is musical. Um, so um, really interesting to um, compare two very different performances. Um, but certainly, no, I don't think the previous movie was an inspiration to either of my leads. That's a really interesting question, because you have to remember the book was written before the war started, um, but the film was made um, a couple of years after the war had ended. So there was a 10-year hiatus in which Britain had gone through this um, completely transformative experience, and all the values that it possessed in 1938 when the book was written were exposed, in a way, as being... Um, hypocritical and shallow and, and indeed the very same values that led an entire generation of, of, of men to their deaths. Um, so I, I do think that what the film was able to bring out from the novel was a sense of Green's um, contempt for not for popular culture, which by the way Green didn't have contempt for. Green had a very complex relationship with popular culture. Um, Contempt was involved in it, but he also rather admired it in some ways, which is why he wrote so many films. What, what the film was able to bring out from the book was Green's contempt of conventional, secular Victorian morality. In other words, a morality that was not rooted in the, the profound, mystical um, strengths of Catholicism, um, the appalling strangeness of God's mercy, which is indeed one of the last lines of the Bolting Brothers movie. Um, so... Um, did, was the movie a, 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 a reflection of Green's contempt for the rise of popular culture? I, I don't think it was. Green wrote the novel um, as an entertainment. 
um, Green understood the importance of writing for an audience and of making a buck. Um, but he also understood that the translation from book into film was a, a necessarily a corrupting force. But as one New York Times critic said, um, you know, who, who else is going to be more interested in corruption than a Catholic? Well, OK, so we know that Brooke Wilkinson, the, the, the film censor at the time, took out a lot of Catholicism. And that wasn't really the, the fault of the filmmakers. And I think it was something that rather upset Green, especially when it was reviewed by some critics as being stripped of Catholicism. Um, uh, to my mind, the most interesting decision that John Bolting made was um, the way he shot the ending of the movie. Green, we know, came up with an alternative ending to the ending in the book. Uh, in the book, um, Rose talks to an old priest. The priest points to her, the, the possibility of her saintliness, uh, and indeed the possibility of Pinky loving her, and off she heads with the record under her arm to face the worst horror of all. And I think the Boltings were right in thinking that this would be a disastrously anticlimactic ending for the movie, and I think Green was brilliant in coming up with the ending he did. It is so devious and so genius that you can watch the ending, and on the one hand, if you are, as that record sticks and Pinky repeats, I love you, I love you, I love you, you know, half the audience who are idealists and romantics can believe that it was divine intervention and, 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 and that in fact, in some sense, God is either protecting Rose or revealing the fact that somewhere deep down Pinky did love Rose, which I think, apt to think is true, or he'd have killed her from, from the outset. Um, the other half of the audience, the, the doubters, the cynics, the skeptics, We'll, we'll see that this is a, a, a story of a deluded young woman. Um, and, 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 and that's brilliant, to be able to please you know, the groundlings and the, and the balcony is, is the mark of a great dramatist, and, and I think the ending is genius. But what Bolting did um, was something Graham Greene didn't like. Bolting, um, uh, Greene had said that the ending should be set in, in a sort of uh, disheveled, borstily church room with a, 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 a rather unattractive nun and it should all be very sort of down at heel. And then, the, and then John Bolting, who directed the movie, cast this rather luscious nun, and everyone's surrounded by a halo of light, and there's this extraordinary camera move off the record, across Rose's face, and up to the crucifix. Um, but Bolting had a, a great justification for that, which is that at the heart of Rose's character, and what makes her ultimately not just a deluded girl who has what's coming to her, is an incredible endurance, an incredible ability to suffer, and an incredible faith against all the evidence. So when you end on the crucifix, what Bolting is telling you is that Rose has in some sense, in his own words, been crucified. In my words would be, Rose is a character of tragic stature because of her ability to suffer. And therefore I used in, the, in my movie exactly the same shot to end the movie as, as the Boltings did. That's a surprisingly complicated question. We know that Alderman Thompson, who I suppose was kind of the mayor at the time, actually stopped them filming on the race course after three days, or I think it was even two days. Uh, um, and, and yes, I know that there were concerns about how the film was, was, was going to portray the city, and indeed the disclaimer on the front highlights those concerns and is, and is an attempt to deal with them. Um, um, we also know that the film shot more on location than, than any film, than any other film um, was used to doing at the time. Only a very small portion of it was shot in Wellin Studios. Um, so we know in a, in a practical sense, in a filmic sense, the location played a huge part. Um, and we know that Brighton was enormously important to Green. He first went there when he was six years old and kind of fell in love with the strange seaside town. It was the place where he saw his very first movie. Um, uh, Queen of Cravonia, I think it was called. Um, but, but here's an irony. Um, Green said, you know, of all the novels he'd written, this was the one least inspired by the actual location. Um, you know, when you read Green's Mexico, you get Mexico. When you read Green's Haiti, you get Haiti. Um, Haiti. But when you read Green's Brighton, you don't. What you get is the Brighton that unfolded thanks to the, the 
dominance that his characters begin to, began to take in the whole process. Um, and I think what's brilliant about the movie is that it reflects both the reality of Brighton uh, and yet takes us into it a sort of purgatorial, surreal version of it, which is, to my mind, probably very close to what Green had in his head.